Hi guys, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I've ha well, let me back up first. I've had this sermon in my heart since last week, early last week. Usually I get sermons in my heart around Thursday, but this one came to me about, I think it was as early as last Sunday night. Anyway, it's called The Three-Edged the Three -edged Sword. Um, I'll explain that title in a minute. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. Speak, Lord, and do what only you can do. Heal, restore, deliver. Make, make this the most powerful sermon I've ever preached for the people. Lord God, let them feel your spirit and receive their love. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, this sermon is called The Three-Edged Sword. Um, I was thinking about all the crap that's going on in the world today. I was thinking about how um, politically messed up we are, how financially messed up we are globally, and how, how just in turmoil we are. Um, and I was thinking about the life of David and how he let these th the three-edged sword really get to him. And the three-edged sword is power, money, and sex. In the right hands, they're tools for greatness in, in marriage. Sex is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, in the right hands, money is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And power, if given to the right person and used for the right reasons, is a wonderful and beautiful thing. Um, but, for, but in the wrong hands and at the wrong time, these three entities can destroy lives and I sense that right now listening to me there is someone that either of these three things power money or sex are destroying your life life and maybe all three um, when we talk about power, what I mean when I say power, I mean leadership. I mean the ability to make the make decisions to affect other people. Um, when I say money, I mean the currency um, of which um, the world is run like. Um, the dollar is currency, whether Canadian or American. The yen is currency. The pound is currency. All of that is currency. And that's what I mean when I say money. Sex, what I mean when I say sex is the um, physical, emotional, spiritual intimacy of a man and a woman. Okay, that's what I mean when I'm talking about the three. So, like, these three entities are in the, they show you who you are. They are three of the most um, sure indicators to reveal who a person is. Give them power, like leadership over people. Give them money, 
um, currency and give them sex, whether where whatever they're attracted to, uh, sexually or whatever, and it will indicate who they are. Um, I think of the life to be safe here. I think of the life of David. Um, David uh, was a shepherd boy in the field and and um, when he was a teenager, I would say about 12 or 13 or maybe even younger, he fought and defeated Goliath. But before he, he fought and defeated Goliath, he killed a lion and a bear. So the Lord was preparing him, I believe, for his um, eventual position. So God will do that. God will prepare you for your avenge for your eventual position, which he'll give you. He'll give you a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more to see how you handle things. And then when he was about a young lad, like um, a young lad, I feel like I'm English. When he was a young boy, he he defeated he defeated Goliath when no one else could. So after he defeated Goliath, years later. Um, he was anointed as king and he wasn't even going to be anointed as king um, he was the last pick he was the last person anyone would think that would be king um, but the, lo the Lord he was almost passed over and the Lord is saying right now you were almost passed over, but he's going to anoint you to greater than you had ever dreamed, you had ever thought. And he's saying, just stay faithful. Just stay faithful. Just stay humble. He sees you serving in that job. He sees you raising those kids. He sees you doing all that and just stay the course because in due time he will exalt you um and then after david became king um and the power and money uh began to get to him what happened was it began to get to his Head. It began to, um, it began to really get to his head, and then that's when the whole Bathsheba, Bathsheba thing happened, where um, David, David um, went on to the roof and saw Bathsheba um, taking a bath. Like she was bathing and he lusted after her so much that um, he sent for her they slept together she got pregnant and um, she got pregnant and then she lost the baby and that uh, no David at, when she got pregnant, instead of owning his responsibility in what he had done, um, what they had done, he he decided to hide what they had they had done by trying by killing. No, first he sent 
her husband home in hopes that they they would sleep together as husband and wife and her husband could pass the baby off as his. Uh, this is better than uh, days of our lives. But because her husband Uriah was so loyal to David because he, he was in David's army, he said, I cannot go home to sleep with my wife but when all these when all these men are on the battlefield so I'm going to stay in the battlefield so it really the power and the money and the sex revealed David's weaknesses revealed who he really was and that's why in these circles when you give somebody power to make decisions that affect other people to make this decisions that affect everybody else you can see how they really are do they manage that power with integrity do they ma manage that power with grace do they ma manage that leadership position with love and understanding and and um, and just foresight of what to do, or do they lord it over people like I'm I'm the man I I'm the president of this company or I'm this or I'm that when power gets to get out of control it can destroy so if you're a ceo listening to this and your whoever is working for you is terrified of you they're prob you're probably lording your power over them in a negative way you're probably you're probably coming uh, to them from a basis of fear and control rather than love and understanding. And the Lord will say, the Lord will say to you, uh, brother, sister, come from a place of love and understanding, not from a place of control and domination. Because control and domination will get you what you want for a little while, but love and understanding and compassion will get you what you want for a lifetime. I'll say that again. Pa coming from a place of control and domination will get you the short-term results, but coming from a place of genuine love, genuine understanding, and genuine concern for the person will get you what you want for a lifetime because people don't respond in the long term to fear and intimidation they people tend to hide when they feel fear people people tend to hide the truth um whereas when you come with love and understanding they can they can more receive the truth from you because they know you genuinely care um there's a saying out there that says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and when you when you look at everyone in your organization as a person and when you can see that they have needs and that they're that they're doing their best and that they're working hard and they can see that you see that most of the time not all of the time but 90 percent of the time they'll go to the ends of the earth for you they'll do whatever you you, you ask them to do 
because they know you see them not just as a job, not this as a person to do the job, but as a person. Because people love being seen as people. And they don't like being seen as just tools to do a job. They're not just tools to do a job. They're, they are actual people with actual lives. See, that's how I operate with, uh, with the people that I work with, the, with the people that get me up every day, with the people that help me uh, with my daily activities. Um, I, I treat everyone like they're a person, like they're not just uh, they're getting paid to serve me, that they're a person with, with a life, with a husband, with kids, with a family. So that's how I operate. And if you come at um, treating them as a person, and if you use your power in, in a loving way, they'll go to anything for you. They'll do whatever you ask them. And sometimes, when you talk about power, loving doesn't mean all fuzzy and fuzzy and fuzzy. Loving means to, to approach them in a gentle way. You can still be tough, but be gentle. You don't have to be tough. Yelling doesn't mean you're tough. Yelling means just you can be loud, like loud. But that doesn't mean you're getting your point across. You can be loving and tough. And sometimes that's what people need. They need tough love. They need discipline. They need restraint. That's what I would say to parents. I'm not a parent yet. But I'm an aunt, and um, children need restraint. A lot of parents, you can either get two types of parents. Parents that um, don't discipline their children at all. They're like, oh, let them be children and whatever. And that's good, but if you don't give children boundaries, they will ruin their lives. So by not giving children boundaries, you're actually hurting, not helping. It's better if you, um, if you give them boundaries now and then they don't pay the consequences later. Give them boundaries now and they'll thank you later rather than letting them run free, do whatever they want now, and they'll hate you later. And that's power. So use your power in a loving way. Use your leadership in a loving way. And I'm not just talking about leadership with companies. I'm talking about your leadership at your church, if you're a pastor, if you're a team lead, if you're an elder, and be a compassionate leader. Try and see what they're going through. Try and see their side and really ask them what's going on. Because re if you see a problem in your organization, let's say someone's always late and you're you're having to wait for them at every meeting. Instead of saying, why are you always late? Take them out, take them away from the um, wor workplace just for a talk. And just say, what's going on in your life? Don't even mention the lateness part. And they, they will tell you in 
like when you're out of the office, maybe take them for coffee in a non-threatening environment. Um, and they will tell you what's going on. And when they do tell you what's going on, when they trust you with that information, you'll be able to decipher and maybe come up with the a compromise, a solution, or something. And that's using your power wise, wisely instead of yelling and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and as far as money goes, I've had, had financial issues in the past. And the thing I have to say about money. I won't spend much time here because I've had my issues. I'm not perfect at this. But when it comes to financial decisions, um, do your research. When it comes to huge financial decisions, do your research. Ask people. Don't just go ahead and spend money that you don't have and live within your means please people just there's no sense in keeping up with the joneses because mr jones doesn't care about you anyway um they have their own issues to deal with and and they don't care about you anyway and this culture is a consumer culture. Ignore all that and live within your means. It's okay to treat yourself once in a while, but sit down with your finances and say, okay, how much is once in a while for me? And what could I treat myself on? Um, could I treat myself to a vacation? Could I treat myself to a movie? Could I treat myself, um, in other ways financially? Or maybe I don't have to treat myself to anything that costs any money. Um, maybe I can treat myself with taking the kids to the park. Or, or reading a good book sending the kids off to my mother's and reading a good book. Um, so I would say sit down with somebody and or even sit down by yourself if, if you don't w want to sit down with somebody. Write down honestly what you can afford to spend on what uh, and um, then you can go from there and ask the Lord. This really helped me. Ask the Lord to keep you on track. And he will put people in your life that will help keep you on track financially. And sometimes he will keep you on track. Um, there's been times where... I've asked the Lord, well, uh, how much do you want me to do for this or that or that? And he'll tell me the number. He'll show me the number like 200 or 100 or 50 or whatever, whatever the case may be. And he will keep me on track. When you bring your finances to the Lord, he will keep you on track. And your first way to um, give your finances to the Lord is through tithing. That is 10% of your income. Now for me, I kind of break it up over the month. So I have, um, I have uh, money to give every month. So every week so you could even do that like because um tithing doesn't have to be all at once like let's say if you get a thousand uh, let's say if you get a 
a thousand dollars for per uh per pay period, like every two weeks. Uh, you can split ten percent of that over the two weeks. So even when you're not getting a check that month, you're still tithing. Uh, that's what I do. You just spread it out over the month and at the end of the month it comes up to 10% than what you actually, of what you earn. Um, that's what I do when it comes to tithing. And offering I do too. Uh, offering is just any financial thing you give to the Lord. And sometimes there's been horrible misuse of funds in, in churches especially. But what I've learned about this is, okay, if I'm tithing, if I'm doing what the Lord has called me to do, if I'm giving back to him what he said legally to give to him, that's all my business. What the church does with his money is not my business. And that might seem harsh. I mean, like, it's my money. What are they doing? No, it's not your money. It's the money that he's assigned you to give to him. So it is his money and you're giving back a portion to him whether you give it to a church, whether you give it to a charity, whatever. But, so, whatever they, they do with your, with the money you give back to God, that's their business. So if they are mismanaging it, if it's being mismanaged and not good ground, um, God will deal with them and trust me when God deals with you, oh my gosh, there is no other judge. So you don't have to worry about it because you're in the clear. Once you're obedient with your finances, God is obligated to open up the windows of heaven and give you blessings that you have not, have not even thought of yet, exceedingly abundantly above all what you can ask or think God is saying. And I think that it's, tithing has been used to get money like, oh, God will bless you if, if you give this or whatever. Truth is, we don't know what God will do with in your personal life and unless the pastor has some revelation about the church but usually we don't know what God will do in your life and sometimes pastors are afraid to say hey we're broke we need money so they use the guise of tithing to um financially um, enhance their church. Whereas I think they should be honest and say we're broke. Uh, we can't pay our light bill. We're having trouble paying staff. I think honesty and transparency uh, in financial matters of a church is um, sorely needed. Um, but that's another story. Uh, so I would say, first of all, tithe, and then ask the Lord um, to either send people into your life or guide you on how to make a budget, or not even budget, let's not say budget, because when I hear budget, I get afraid, I get like, oh my God, and I get hives, but let's say, um, let's say how to spend god will guide you 
either through another one person or just through your relationship and conversation with God. He will guide you on what to spend your money on. Um, and then sex. Now, this is a very touchy subject, and I will try my best to uh, talk about it in a really constructive way. Um, when, when we talk about sex in the church, we usually talk about waiting for marriage and all that stuff, and all that stuff is Cool. All that stuff is biblical. Yes, it's biblical to wait for marriage. Um, but we don't really say why and we don't really say um, we don't really say anything else about sex except wait for marriage. And you have people struggling with all kinds of sexual things and you have people uh, struggling with porn addiction, you have um, people, boyfriends and girlfriends uh, sleeping together and then coming to church and nobody knows because nobody knows that they're living together but they are, they are fornicating and first of all let me say this, there is grace for anyone who is committing sin. There is grace all around for anyone who is committing sin, including sexual sin. So God's grace is able to forgive anything. All you need to do is ask him for forgiveness. And that's the first thing. The second thing is um, for me, I'm going to share a bit of my personal story. Uh, for me, uh, sexual things has, have always been a struggle for me because I've had, I've, I had, a, I have, um, a really high sexual appetite and I can tell, um, I can tell, like when I get married, oh God, um, and the way God has been dealing with me about it is he's not saying no. He's not saying don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He's not saying don't be tempted by it, don't be tempted by it. He's just saying not yet. And he's causing me to imagine what it'll be like when I am in covenant, when I am with my husband, when I am in, when I am in enjoying sex in my marriage. And I think part of the problem is, um, we're just so busy saying don't, 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 that we need more married people to say, I waited and it was, awesome, awesome, or I waited, and it was terrible the first time, but we had to get into a rhythm together. We need more married people um, talking to us singles and encouraging us, because it's very hard. In this sexualized society, I can tell you uh, from a 35 year old single virgin, single Christian who is also a virgin. It is very difficult. So what we need is encouragement. And what I will tell to every single person out there, hold on, he or she is coming. And that's, um, what the, what the Lord actually um, revealed to me was, he's like, what would you, just think of, just think of the morning after your wedding. You were with your husband for the first time or 
whatever, and you look down and you see your ring that he gave to you and your ring is the bill of sale and you understand that he is yours and you are his and now because you're in covenant you can be free to enjoy you can be free to explore but when you're not married when you're not in covenant you always have to be concerned with oh my god is this person gonna give me a disease is this person sleeping with other people is this person going to you know you know hurt me like you know when you're single there are all these worries to work to to think about um versus when you are married in in covenant with another person and i'm not saying um there cannot be affairs and other stuff that happens but i'm saying in god's perfect plan he wants us to enjoy sex in marriage because he wants us to have the freedom the ability to explore that in covenant to explore each other together in covenant and to have no worries about oh my gosh is he gonna call the next day or whatever he wants us to be free of all that so that's why he says no sex before marriage because he loves us so much he wants us to feel free he wants us to feel alive and he says, you know what, what, um, he said to me, you know what, and I'm very open with God when it comes to my sex drive, when it comes, uh, when I feel, excuse the word, when I feel horny, excuse the word, um, I'm very open with God. I'm like, God, I feel horny right now, help me. And he does. So I think singles need to be open with God. M married people need to openly talk to singles about sex. Not just don't do it when you're until you're married, but they need the real. They need the honest truth about it. And I know it's a sensitive subject, but find, ask the Lord and say, who, what woman or what man can I talk to about this? I need some encouragement. I need some help. And he will, he will supply that for you. Um, so guys, Thank you so much today for listening to this and I pray that God blessed you with my talk about the three-edged sword. Money, pow power, money, and sex. I hope I gave you tools for your everyday life um, regarding these topics. Um, thanks. Have a good day. Be blessed. See you next week. Bye.